Good afternoon. I'm Lorna Lucas. I'm Assistant Director of Provider Education for the Association of Community Cancer Centers. And I'm here today to introduce Dr. Lee Schwartzberg as our expert presenter and ICLEO Advisory Committee Chair for this fourth e-course in the series hosted by the Institute for Clinical Immunology, or ICLEO. And many of you may know ICLEO was founded in 2015 as an institute of ACCC and currently the only initiative to prepare multidisciplinary cancer care providers for the complex implementation of IO in the community. The IO program provides a host of educational resources and tools such as webinars, newsletters, our e-learning module courses, tumor subcommittee updates, and an immersive IO preceptorship and a host of live meetings, which I hope you'll actually join us and Dr. Schwartzberg um, and our, the rest of our esteemed faculty for the second iCLEO National Conference on September 30th in Philadelphia. Now for today's e-course, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Schwartzberg, who serves as the Executive Director of the West Cl Cancer Center and the Medical Director and Senior Partner of the West Clinic. He's also a Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the University of Tennessee. And Dr. Schwartzberg was the Founding Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Community Oncology and also serves as the Editor-in-Chief of the Practice Update Oncology website. In addition, a host of other responsibilities that Dr. Schwartzberg also has, his major research interests are now all on new therapeutic approaches to breast cancer, targeted therapy, and supportive care. And he has published more than 150 research papers during his oncology career. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. Schwartzberg as our presenter and author of the ICLEO Advisory Chair. Now for a few housekeeping notes, please feel free to submit your questions to our presenter by typing in the box on your dashboard panel. We are also joined by Dr. Maria Ho, McGivney Global Advisors, who will pose questions to Dr. Schwartzberg following the presentation. The webinar will be archived and slides will be available on the iCLEO website, which is www.iclio-cancer.org. All right, now I'll kick, send it over to Dr. Schwartzberg to kick off the website. Thank you very much, Lorna. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here again and uh, do this webinar for iCLEO. We're about six weeks out from ASCO, and again, as the high water meeting of the year, we were inundated with abstracts, posters, and presentations regarding immunotherapy at ASCO. We've done a part one where we went over most of the clinical data that was relevant to immunotherapy in tumors. And to, because we had so much, we created a part two, and today we're going to focus on biomarkers for immunotherapy. If I could have the next slide, please. So our objectives for today's meeting are to discuss PDL1 as a biomarker for PD1 and PDL1 checkpoint inhibitors, to look at tumor mutational burden as a predictor of response, to assess checkpoint inhibition in colorectal cancer with high microsatellite instability and or mismatch repair deficiency, and to see how these factors uh, interact with checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and to look at the role of oncogenic viruses in predicting immunotherapeutic response. Next, please. So we have many different biomarkers to think about. And the question is, why do we need biomarkers with immunotherapy? Immunotherapy is a therapy that could be broadly applicable because we're not targeting the cancer, we're targeting the immune system to go and kill the cancer. We've already seen, as we've discussed in uh, previous settings and meetings, that we, uh, we can see responses in a variety of different tumors to immunotherapy. And the focus, uh, when I'm talking about immunotherapy today, will be predominantly, if not entirely, on the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, which are inhibitors of PD-1 or PD-L1. But what we also know is that only a, a fraction of patients with the diseases we treat with at least single agents uh, immunotherapy drugs will respond to the checkpoint inhibitors. In uh, tumors, non-melanoma tumors, those are usually a fraction below 50%, so a minority of patients are responding. And that begs the question, why do we see variable response? And as in any therapy, in any disease, we've learned that by understanding the biology 
and hoping to find a biomarker or a series of biomarkers which can help us predict uh, the outcome, pre uh, predict response to therapy, in some cases be prognostic for therapy, uh, they're very helpful. So the goal of uh, these biomarkers are to look for these clinical factors. And we're already determining, even in this young uh, portion of our understanding of immunotherapy uh, drugs, that there are a number of different biomarkers for immunotherapy. And we're going to talk about these. And there was really quite a bit of information from ASCO on this very exciting emerging field, looking at what we can determine to help us choose the best patients who are candidates for immunotherapy. And those include uh, biomarkers that are immunologic, such as PDL1, that are interestingly genetic, and we'll talk about those, that includes tumor burden and MSI and MMR. And even viral uh, infections can be a type of biomarker for immunotherapy, and we'll go over the evidence for each of these. Next, please. So let's focus first on PDL1 as a biomarker. And this is something that from the very dawn of checkpoint inhibitors of the PDL1s and the PD1 inhibitors, we've already known that this might be a, an important biomarker. Uh, that said, there is still a lot of uncertainty about how best to use PDL1 and uh, what its meaning is. So let's go through the most recent data. Next, please. The reason that PDL1 is a complicated biomarker is that it can be expressed, first of all, in multiple cell types in the tumor microenvironment. And opposed to other biomarkers which we look at, for example, uh, the HER2 biomarker on a tumor cell, like a breast cancer cell, the PDL1 is not uh, relevant when it's expressed um, on, uh, on certain cells but it's relevant to, the, to particular cells like the tumor cells and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So we can see this on a variety of cells. We're not looking just at the cancer cell, we're looking at the microenvironment as a whole and trying to figure out where the expression of PDL1 is, which again is used as an escape mechanism by the tumor to avoid uh, immune uh, reactions. So the way we test for PDL1 currently is using an immunohistochemical test, and that is looking for protein expression. The problem is when you do an IHC test, you may not always know exactly which cells you're looking at. But what we want to look at, and what in general we believe is the, is the most appropriate cell at the moment, is to look at PDL1 expression on tumor cells. So when there's a very heterogeneous stroma, that may be difficult when there's a lot of uh, infiltration by different lymphocytes. We may see them on those. We're still not sure about sorting out PDL1 on these other immune effector cells. We also see heterogeneity of PDL1 expression even in an individual patient at different time points. So if we sample a tumor and look at the microenvironment, the interaction between the tumor cells and the host cells and the immune inflammatory cells that are in that tumor, we can see the amount of PDL1 expression change over time. Uh, we can actually see it change in response to therapy. So there's some emerging data that in non-small cell lung cancer, for example, one can induce PDL1 expression by treating the patient with chemotherapy. Therefore, we might see more PDL1 expression in patients who are pretreated um, as opposed to before they were treated with chemotherapy. That's not yet a consistent finding, but it's an interesting observation. In addition, PDL1 expression can vary at different locations, and that's not so surprising if one thinks about that the immune system might have many different interactions at different, uh, that may be organ specific, or might be uh, vascular specific, or might have to do with uh, proximity to primary tumors or a host of other issues in which case you might see heterogeneity in the, t in the immune response and therefore heterogeneity in the amount of PDL1 expressed on tumor cells to try to inhibit that response. Moreover, PDL1 can be very focal, so you can see it only in, in a small area of the tumor. So there could be a sampling issue 
if one takes a needle biopsy, you may not be uh, representative of the entire tissue. We know that's true for tumor cells in general, and it also is true for this uh, stromal interaction. So we have to be very careful there. Finally, uh, the actual technique to measure PDL1 is still somewhat controversial. There are a number of different antibodies that are out there that are commercially available, all of which give a range of different immunohistochemical expression. And uh, there, we don't yet have a very tightly standardized uh, definition of how to determine positivity, the number of percentage of cells positive, how strongly they stain positive, and which antibody to use in a lockdown fashion so that everyone is testing PDL1 the same. I think that will be coming in the near future as the pathologists and oncologists continue to standardize this field. And this, is, again, is reminiscent of HER2, where there was a similar type of heterogeneity early on in, um, in the testing, and that has become much more standardized now. So I believe that that will happen with PDL1 testing over the next couple of years as well. Next, please. So turning to the data, here is PDL1 expression uh, correlated with response to pembrolizumab in non-small cell lung cancer. And what this study looked at was pembrolizumab compared to docetaxel in uh, previously treated non-small cell lung cancer patients. We're looking at three endpoints here, uh, overall survival, progression-free survival, and overall response rate. The first number in each of the columns is the PEMBRO uh, response or uh, output, and the second number is the uh, docetaxel. So if you first look at the second number across all of these columns, and these are divided by uh, intensity of PDL1 expression, so one to tw no patient in this study had 0% PDL1. In order to get onto this phase three trial, every patient was positive, but the range of positivity was broad, and it was broken down into 1 to 24, 25 to 49, 50 to 74, or greater than 75% PDL1 expression. First thing you see, if you look at the docetaxel results, there's really no difference across any of these endpoints, across any expression of PDL1 as, uh, as characterized here as a tumor progression score or TPS. So what that tells us is that PDL1 is not a prognostic factor in this study. Independent of therapy, it's not showing any impact on docetaxel. Contrast that to what you see with the PEMBRO, which is the first number in each pair. As the TPS increases, each of these output endpoints goes up. So if you start from the bottom, overall response rate, you see it about doubles as the uh, TPS goes up and then doubles again for those that have the highest uh, percentage of PDL1 expression. The same thing is true to a lesser extent in progression-free survival, and you see that the progression-free survival more than doubles between the lowest positive expression and the highest positive expression. Most importantly, for overall survival, even patients who had just 1% PDL1 expression, their overall survival was uh, numerically better than for docetaxel. But as the, the PDL1 expression increased, it went up substantially, and particularly for those patients who had 50% or greater PDL1 expression, you see about a doubling of overall survival for PEMBRO compared to docetaxel in these highly PDL1 expressing tumors. Next, please. This is uh, a study in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's lymphoma is a very interesting tumor because what we know about Hodgkin's lymphoma is that the tumor cells themselves, the, the, the cells that are the standard of uh, the definition of the disease are called Reed-Sternberg cells. And Reed-Sternberg cells have a uh, abnormality which affects the PDL1 and PDL2 location so there's a chromosome 9 aberration in Reed-Sternberg cells, which is almost uniformly found. And this shows copy number alterations of these particular genes. What does that mean? It means that, that Reed-Sternberg cells are exquisitely um, expressing PD1, PDL1 and PDL2. They're making lots of, of copies of this ligand because the, the gene itself, it, itself is amplified. That suggests that Hodge, classical Hodgkin's lymphoma might respond 
to PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors. And in fact, this is the data from nivolumab and pembrolizumab in patients that had been heavily pretreated with refractory and relapsed classical Hodgkin's disease. And you can see here, these are small studies because uh, this is a small group of patients, yet the results are pretty striking. The overall response rate in these heavily pretreated patients uh, ranges from 66 to 83 percent across the drugs. For the uh, study that we have a little more data on, the nivolumab, the median progression free survival is 10 months, and most patients tolerated the drug. These striking phase two studies led to the approval of nivolumab just recently in the last couple of months for classical Hodgkin's disease that had relapsed after autologous stem cell transplant and post-transplant brentuximab of adodin. And just to put that in context, this is uh, patients who fail stem cell transplant with Hodgkin's, most of whom are cured if they get that. And then if they fail, many of them can be cured or at least put into remission with brentuximab vidotin. So this is the hot, most highly refractory group of patients. And now we have another therapy for them. Next slide, please. This PDL1 story remains complicated, though. It seems to vary from disease to disease. So I showed you clear indication that in non-small cell lung cancer, the more PDL1 you have, it, presumably the better the outcome with checkpoint inhibitors. That is not necessarily true in renal cancer. And this is the phase three study looking at nivolumab in renal cancer compared to everolimus, which showed a benefit and showed that, um, that uh, patients, unselected patients with nivolumab did better than everolimus in terms of survival. But when they went back and looked at PDL1 expression, since in this case you could be either negative or positive in this large trial, it, you can see the curves look very similar whether the patients were PDL1 negative or PDL1 positive. This is, in my, uh, in my estimation, unlikely to be secondary to the drug itself and more likely to be a reflection of other immune factors going on in this particular disease. So we have to be careful when we're thinking about the biomarker here may not be uniformly useful in every disease and may have different impacts on predictive value to therapy in different diseases. Next slide, please. And in fact, we know that PDL1 negative patients can respond to anti PD1 and PDL1 therapies across tumor types. So, this slide gives you um, what we know to date about, about responses. So, here we're looking at overall response rate, which arguably is not necessarily the best surrogate for. Uh, the benefit from uh, checkpoint inhibitors, but it's the easiest one to determine early on. So what we can see here is that across a variety of tumor types, including squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, non-small cell lung cancer, melanoma, and urothelial cancer, there are a proportion of patients who respond even when they are clearly pdl one negative. That proportion seems to vary across different diseases, uh, and but is in general is in the range of uh, between 7 and 15 percent for single agent checkpoint inhibitors. One of the things that's very interesting is that in very early studies, as you can see here, when you add uh, another checkpoint inhibitor, in this case the CTLA-4 inhibitor, ipilimumab, in both melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer, it appears that the uh, response rate to immunotherapy goes up in the PDL1 negative patient population. So it may be but that uh, by further stimulating the immune system, both in terms of priming with ipilimumab and then the effector cells with, uh, with um, PD-1 inhibitor or, or PD-L1 inhibitor, one can uh, overcome that relative resistance and make the response rate even higher. From a practical perspective, what this tells us is that PD-L1 is an imperfect biomarker to either exclude or include patients who should get uh, therapy with a checkpoint inhibitor. And as we're moving into an era of, of uh, combined therapy, the relevance of PDL1 uh, expression as a biomarker when used in combination remains to be elucidated. Next slide, please. Okay, let's move on to the next topic, which is tumor mutational burden as a biomarker. Next, please. 
This slide has become now a very famous slide to show. It's from a study that was done uh, a few years back and published in Nature. And what it basically shows is the mut somatic mutational frequency observed across a whole host of different cancers. And to orient you to the slide, there's a semi-log plot. So on the y-axis here, you're seeing factors of 10 for each mark. Uh, and that's the number of mutations found in the cancer that therefore somatic mutations, not germline mutations, uh, plotted against the different types of tumors. This was done with whole exome sequencing, and, and that's important because whole exome sequencing is not typically commercially available uh, today, but this, as part of the uh, Cancer uh, Genome Atlas, uh, was available in a research setting. If you look over at the far end on the right of this, which cancers have the most mutations on average compared to their normal, uh, normal tissue counterpart? In the, in these were all matched in, uh, against uh, germline uh, tissue in each patient. What, uh, unsurprisingly, the tumor that has the most mutations on average is melanoma. Aha, melanoma responds very well to immunotherapy. Next most common, squamous cell cancer of the lung. So does that respond to, uh, to immunotherapy. Next most common, adenocarcinoma of the lung another responding tumor that we learned early on. And the next most common after that, bladder cancer. So there's a, there's a theme here that the, already all of the diseases where we have approved indications and drugs that are on the market for uh, PD-1s and PD-L1s and uh, checkpoint inhibitors are, are all the tumors that have the highest mutational burden. So that suggests that something is going on with mutations that uh, causes response to immunotherapy. Next slide, please. So uh, before I describe this slide, let me tell you why, what the correlation is with mutational burden and uh, response to checkpoint inhibitors. It is now known that when you have more mutations in a tumor, that leads to more neoantigens. Those are expression of peptides, or abnormal proteins because they're mutated in cells and on the surface of cancer cells, which gives more opportunity for the immune system to recognize those as non-self or foreign antigens and send the immune mechanism into action, which of course can be disinhibited by uh, checkpoint inhibitors because the cancer cell is locked in the struggle to turn off the immune system and has its own mechanisms like expressing pdl one so therefore, there's a concept that more mutations leads to more neoantigens, which leads to more uh, response to immunotherapy. And this is the hypothesis uh, upon which assessing total uh, tumor mutation burden is uh, built. Now, we can't do whole exome sequencing on, on all patients today. And this was a study that was presented at um, ASCO by the Vanderbilt Group and what they did was they correlated uh, total mutational burden by looking at a limited gene set and compared it to whole exome sequencing. Now, the limited gene set uh, uh, testing is commercially available with a number of labs now that can be done, as well as uh, in, sometimes in academic institutions, they can do panels of genes. These panels range from 50 to 500, but in general, they're in the 2, 300, 400 uh, gene panel. And this shows you a very good correlation between what you get with this most, more limited set of genes in order to determine uh, total mutational burden compared to whole exome sequencing. So I think we can be uh, relatively confident that we can, if, we doing, if we're doing molecular profiling on our patients to look for specific mutations, it also could potentially give us a total mutational burden um, number and that might be important in, in selecting patients for immunotherapy. Next slide, please. So they looked at the response of total mutational burden, or TMB, with immunotherapy and melanoma. And this was 65 patients who was treated with checkpoint inhibitors. And you can see that those that had t high TMB, and just to define how this is uh, expressed, it's the number of mutations per uh, megabase 
of uh, DNA that's examined. And there are different cutoffs. There's no standard in this yet. But uh, for this group, the high, uh, a high TMB was greater than 23, a low was less than 3, and the rest were intermediate. And the patients who had high mutational burden had a very high response rate uh, compared to those who had uh, low mutational burden here. In addition, the responders, um, uh, oh, this doesn't show up by the PDL one, sorry. Um, if you look at the right hand panel, you can see that uh, with one exception, the non responders did not have a high mutational burden. And the responders, some of whom had uh, high mutational burdens, but some responders uh, did not as well. So, I would not say not to offer this therapy at this early stage to patients who did not have a, a, a high mutational burden. But on the other hand, patients who have high mutational burden in the absence of other biomarkers potentially could be candidates for uh, immunotherapy. Next slide, please. And the long-term outcome was also correlated with TMB in this particular study. So you see in the green line in the top that progression-free survival and overall survival were substantially higher in the patients who had high mutational burden. So it wasn't just response, it was, it was duration of response as well. So this is emerging as a very interesting marker, and uh, many groups now are looking at their own data and uh, looking at patients that are being treated with um, PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors and seeing in other diseases and in research studies and seeing if total mutation burden does correlate the way it seems to in uh, melanoma so far. Next, please. So this is another study that looked at it in non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, again here, uh, this was done by comprehensive genomic profiling, which was um, uh, a panel, not whole exome sequencing, um, looked at non-small cell lung cancer patients. The cutoffs were different here, but the same message. The patients who had high tumor uh, mutational load had a much longer time on their anti-PD-1 uh, therapy than those that had a lower mutational load. And you can see in the graph on the right that uh, that Patients with high TMB were almost non-overlapping in terms of um, their potential for survival compared to those with low TMB. So we now have data in two, two different disease states. Next, please. What about um, urothelial cancer? We've talked about melanoma and we've talked about um, non-small cell lung cancer. So this was an exploratory analysis presented at ASCO focusing on the tumor type and the response to atezolizumab, which is pdl one inhibitor. And uh, first, I'm showing you the results by pdl one status. So the patients who had the high pdl one status had a higher response rate than those that had none or, or low. And you can see that also in the curve on the right with a, a survival that actually uh, doubled for those patients who had high PDL1. So, like non small cell lung cancer, it appears that in uh, urothelial cancers, PDL1 expression will predict for both response and overall survival. Next slide, please. In this particular set, they looked at another marker, which was the, the, um, the molecular uh, genotype of the disease. So uh, bladder cancer can be sorted by molecular profiling into a variety of different subsets, um, which in this categorization are called luminal or basal. And it turned out that just by looking at the gene expression in these subsets of patients, that uh, the patients who are so-called luminal 2 uh, by the TCGA subtype had a higher chance of uh, PR or even CR compared to any of the other three groups that are uh, genomically defined. And in fact, it looks like it's about twice as high for response rate uh, for this group. So this is now another interesting clue that one could go back and look at intrinsic subtypes uh, molecularly uh, defined. We're not looking at mutations here, per se. We're just looking at a subtype where uh, different genes are expressed in different ways um, in uh, cells, in, in tumors that otherwise might look morphologically the same. So this is uh, the first results that I'm aware of looking from this perspective, and this is another area of opportunity um, to find biomarkers for response in, uh, in uh, immunotherapy. 
Next slide, please. And they also looked at a total mutational burden uh, in urothelial cancer in the response to tezolizumab. And again here, those that had the highest uh, TMB had the best uh, overall survival, and that's shown in uh, the curves to your right in two different cohorts, one that were platinum-treated uh, urothelial cancer and one that were first-line cisplatinum-ineligible urothelial cancers. And in both groups, the results look very similar. Those that had the highest levels of mutational burden had the highest chance of prolonged response to the PDL1 inhibitor. So uh, as individual biomarkers, each of these may be important. Next, please. Okay, let's move on to our third topic, microsatellite instability and mismatch repair deficiency as biomarkers. The next slide, please. So uh, to continue this theme, this has to do with, uh, uh, with another aspect of DNA uh, changes, and that is microsatellite instability and mismatch repair deficiency. This is a somewhat complicated uh, issue because of the way the terms are named, and it's, it's a little confusing, so I'll go through it. So microsatellite instability refers to the fact that in all of the, our DNA, we have these uh, short tandem repeat sequences of DNA, which might go like CG, 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 which are called microsatellites because they can be shown in a light microscope. That, uh, so that's how they were originally shown. That's why they're called microsatellites. They have these little dots on them if you look at chromosomes. So that is a marker for um, mutation. And if you find a lot of these microsatellites, uh, also called microsatellite instability high, that is indicative of a hypermutated phenotype. Uh, one could have microsatellite instability low or more commonly to high microsatellite stable. In other words, you have just the normal amount of microsatellites and there's not increased amounts of these. These can be detected by, uh, by DNA testing uh, reactions like PCR. So that's one way to detect it. M MSI, or macrosatellite instability, is caused by DNA mismatch repair deficiency. DNA is repaired by a very large number of enzymes and complicated mechanisms that are highly redundant. And that makes sense because evolutionarily we need to repair our DNA every single time a, a cell divides to have fidelity in the DNA through our entire lifetime. So our bodies have evolved uh, many different mechanisms to do this. And one of the mechanisms is called mismatch repair. And that is when you have a mismatch in uh, base pairs, like the normal AT and CG base pairs are mismatched. There are one set of mechanisms to repair that is called mismatch repair. And there are a bunch of different genes and enzymes that do that, as you might expect, and they're listed here. MLH1, 3, MSH2, 3, 6, PMS1, and 2. If there is an inactivating mutation in any of these mismatch repair genes, that can lead to microsatellite instability. MSA, a microsatellite instability high is, norm, is typically due to the inactivation of MLH1. That's the one that's most commonly seen. We can measure inactivating mutations in MMR genes uh, a variety of ways, but the easiest way to, to do that is by immunohistochemical techniques, so to look for protein expression. And if they're missing, uh, then typically one might reflex to, uh, to doing the DNA test for MSI. Now, why is, this all, why is this complicated system important? Well, we've known for many years that, uh, that MSI high is found not infrequently in colorectal cancer. In fact, 15% of colorectal cancers are MSI high. Now, to make it more complicated, there are two subgroups there. One subgroup is because of Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome is a uh, inherited germline deficiency of one of the mismatch repair genes. So if you lose that in your germline, that increases your risk for colon cancer and for endometrial cancer and perhaps others. So if you get colon cancer in a Lynch syndrome patient, it will be MSI high. But other colon cancers are sporadic MSI high, which means that for some other reason, there was loss of an MMR gene and that caused the MSI. 
Now, we've also known for some years now that MSI high is associated with improved overall survival in colorectal cancer. In fact, in stage 2 colorectal cancers that have MSI high, um, they do not need chemotherapy because they have an excellent prognosis. So to put this all together, the, uh, the schema on the bottom sort of sums it up. So you start with a mutation in MMR, which can either be germline or acquired. Uh, that leads to deficiency of, uh, of mismatch repair mechanisms. That leads to microsatellite instability highly expressed, and that leads ultimately to a high total mutational burden. Hope you're all with me on this. <laughs> Next slide, please. So what, how does this matter? Well, we've known now for a couple of years that the results with colorectal cancer in general to immune checkpoint inhibitors have been relatively disappointing. They, ha they did not show uh, a high level of response. However, if you break up the uh, colorectal cancer patients into MSI high versus MS uh, stable or MSI low, you see very different results. So this was uh, uh, going back an analysis of a phase two study that looked at either nivolumab as a single agent or nivolumab plus ipilimumab in colorectal cancer patients. And there's some interesting things here. So first of all, if you look at the nivolumab by itself, uh, here you're only looking at the microsatellite high group um, in the first column. You see the overall response rate is, uh, is very reasonable is at 25%. Um, the progression-free survival is reasonable. These are heavily pretreated patients, and the overall survival is good with a, a low discontinuation rate. So it looks in this series, and uh, also that was, that was presented at ASCO, but also other studies that have been published previously that show that MSI high colorectal cancer responds to single-agent PD-1 inhibitors. Now, what happens if you add uh, ipilimumab? Well, uh, right now it looks like maybe there's an increase in overall response rate and maybe even progression-free survival and overall survival here. There was also, uh, but if you add ipilimumab to the microsatellite stable group, we don't see tremendous responses even uh, in the combination therapy, although perhaps there's a hint of improvement in overall survival. Uh, however, there is increased toxicity to the combination, as we know, and more patients discontinued. So, I think to this point we can say uh, nivolumab is a single agent or nivolumab and ipilimumab uh, do demonstrate durable responses in MSI high colorectal cancer. Next slide, please. The same thing has been shown for pembrolizumab. So this was another study presented at uh, ASCO using, pem uh, using pembrolizumab in, in this case defined as MMR deficient colorectal cancer but again, I would use these relatively synonymously. MSI high is uh, relatively synonymous to MMR. And as I said, MNR deficiency can be associated with Lynch syndrome more sporadic. And here, uh, you can see that the patients who had defects in MMR had a very high response rate to pembrolizumab, whereas those that were uh, proficient in MMR or microsatellite stable had no responses. So, and you see the overall survival was also uh, substantially better for the MMR deficient patients. So we now have two uh, data sets that suggest that single agent therapy is uh, effective in um, MMR deficient, i.e. MSI patients. Next, please. So we have a lot to learn more about, uh, about mismatch repair uh, defects. And the reason this is important is that a small percentage of other cancers, smaller than in colon cancer, but we see a, a few percentage of patients in many different types of cancers that may exhibit uh, MSI high or MMR deficient. And even if that's a small percentage, those patients could potentially be very highly enriched for response to checkpoint inhibitors. So we're looking at uh, those now in a variety of trials, and I fully suspect that in uh, ASCO 2017 we'll see a lot more data on that. Okay, let's go on to our final topic, oncogenic uh, viruses as biomarkers. Next slide, please. Now, we know that uh, there are virally mediated cancers, and over the last few years, we've learned that uh, squamous cell cancers, both of the head and neck and of the cervix, are often mediated by HPV. In fact, uh, HPV-positive uh, squamous cell cancer of the head and neck 
is biologically a very different disease than the HPV negative, and that can be determined by uh, testing for P16, which is a surrogate for uh, HPV status in oral pharyngeal uh, squamous cell cancers. So this was a study of nivolumab versus chemotherapy of investigators' choice, Checkmate 141, and it was a, a, a positive trial overall for nivolumab in that setting, um, as we previously presented. They went back and, and divided the patients into whether they were P16 positive or negative, and you can see that the results uh, were favored the P16 positive patients in terms of survival for those who received uh, nivolumab. So um, it looks here that uh, whereas in the right-hand column there's no clear uh, benefit of nivolumab in the P16 negative. So this may be another biomarker that we can use in this particular subset of patients that are HPV infected in about half that we can see uh, whether or not these patients would be, this would be a predictive biomarker for um, whether a particular subset of squamous cell cancer, the head and neck, would respond better to nivolumab or chemo. Next, please. And uh, this is with pembrolizumab um, uh, in HPV positive, similar results, uh, smaller population, but um, what you see here is that uh, it does seem to be a trend towards, in this case, just response rate for HPV positive compared to HPV negative. These are very small numbers and we don't have the survival data yet, but everything is directionally very similar. Next, please. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. yeah. Um, okay, and then uh, another interesting disease is Merkel cell tumors, and we've seen now that Merkel cell tumors seem to be very sensitive to uh, PD-1 and PDL1 inhibitors. So this is a study that looked at uh, a drug called Avelumab, which is an anti-PDL1 um, uh, inhibitor in Merkel cell cancer, and they looked at it from the perspective of number one whether PDL1 expression made a difference, and number two whether a, a virus that is often associated with Merkel cell, which is called the polyoma virus, uh, played a role here in the same way we just saw for HPV and squamous cell cancers. So they looked here and they see responses, as you can see, uh, in both groups. So it does look like, although there's a lot of overlap, that the PDL1 positive patients um, have somewhat higher responses compared to those that are PDL1 negative, although PDL1 negatives clearly respond. So it's the same story that we've seen in other diseases. For, however, for the Merkel cell polyoma virus, we don't uh, see that same response that, and, uh, that we saw with HPV. Again, I would say these are fairly small uh, patient populations, but it doesn't seem that, uh, that Merkel cell polyoma virus is a good biomarker to date to pick patients for um, of this type of therapy because both groups respond. So these are very early data, and we have a lot more to learn about the interaction between viral infections and cancer and what they are doing in terms of neoantigens, mutational load, and response to immunotherapies. Next, please. So in summary, ASCO was a tremendous treasure trove of information around immunotherapy as we, we've presented in both part one and part two of this webinar. PD-L1 expression correlated with response to pembrolizumab in non-small cell lung cancer. Nivolumab and pembrolizumab both show high response in Hodgkin lymphoma, and that in part is probably due to the fact that PD-L1 and PD-L2 are very highly expressed in those tumors. PDL1 expression did not predict for clinical benefit of nivolumab in renal cell cancer, so we should not assume automatically that every cancer is the same when it comes to using this biomarker. And, and we also know that in, in every ca case where it's been investigated, there are at least some patients who respond who are PDL1 negative to, uh, to checkpoint inhibitors. Next, please. Total mutational burden is very interesting, and it seems to correlate with immunotherapy outcome in melanoma and with time on immunotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer. We'll be seeing much more about this. In, um, in urothelial cancers, PDL1 one uh, tumor burden and also potentially the TCGA molecular subtype are independent predictors of response to therapy. Uh, in the patients who have MSI high colorectal cancer, uh, 
Uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab demonstrate durable responses, and I would also say that single-agent checkpoint inhibitors and MSI high have substantial benefit, uh, and that was uh, as seen in the MMR-deficient uh, patients treated with pembrolizumab as well as nivolumab. There's preliminary data showing a trend to a higher response or benefit of PD-1 therapy in HPV-positive head and neck patients. And uh, we a value map shows activity in, in uh, Merkel cell uh, tumors regardless of the PDL1 status and uh, the polyoma virus status. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. We have some time for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Schwartzberg. Um, we, we do have a few questions, and uh, First one is regarding non-small cell lung cancer. Um, do you think there should be a PDL1 expression requirement for use of an anti anti PD1 or PDL1 agent as first line therapy? And if so, um, do you think it should lead to a similar requirement in subsequent therapy? Okay. Well, there's a lot of questions in that question. So the first question, I think, is should PD-L1 be used as a biomarker to select uh, PD-1 antibody therapy? And uh, I think the answer is that it is not, uh, it, that there are patients who respond who are PD-1 negative. With nivolumab, the studies were done without selection for PD-L1, and we saw for the whole group a uh, better outcome in the second line or beyond setting for patients who received nivolumab compared to a chemotherapy like docetaxel. The pembrolizumab studies were, de were, um, were actually performed in a different fashion. To get on those trials in non-small cell lung cancer, you had to be at least 1% PD-L1 positive. And as you could see there, there was an increased response as the PD-L1 levels went up, but there were responders in the low PDL1 positive patients. There is evidence that uh, a, a small percentage of patients will respond in, um, to those that are PDL1 negative to both drugs. So when thinking about using it in the second line or beyond, I don't think that PDL1 status is an absolute marker despite the regulatory um, conditions that were placed on the drugs because of the way the trials were conducted. And I don't think there's substantial difference, as far as we can tell, uh, in, in the clinical setting of using either of these drugs in those settings. Now, the first-line setting is very different. Um, and the reason for that is, if you look at the second-line data, again, survival was better and toxicity was less. And uh, the benefit of chemotherapy in the second line in non-small cell lung cancer is modest to begin with. We don't know yet in the first-line setting whether PDL1 will be uh, will be a strong predictive biomarker for outcome, and because we have a lot of substantial data on um, on platinum doublet therapy in non-small cell lung cancer, we're not ready to make that leap yet. So I don't. The answer is we don't know yet how PDL1 will be used in the first line setting. It is you could you could hypothesize that uh, patients with PDL1 positivity will get the most benefit from a, a checkpoint inhibitor containing regimen in the first line setting and perhaps it will be a, uh, an outcome marker but it may not be so we have to wait for the data there for sure in addition we don't know exactly how pdl1 inhibitors are going to be used in the first line will they be used alone in combination will they be used in combination with uh, chemotherapy will they be used as maintenance therapy Will they be used upon a progression? So we've got a lot to learn in that setting yet. Thank you very much. Um, another question is: um, Should we test for PDL1 in immune cells or tumor cells or both? That's a complicated question. So we don't know the answer to that fully yet. From a practical perspective, right now it should be tested in tumor cells. So the data that we have based on these increasing responses um, is due to uh, tumor cell testing, which means a couple of things. You need a very reliable lab to do this testing. They have to both be able to do the test 
in a repetitive fashion with good quality control with the right antibodies and, the, and good pathologists scoring these. And they also have to have good pathologists who can distinguish tumor cells from immune cells, which is not a trivial uh, problem in many cases where the tumor cells can look like immune cells. So this is, um, this is uh, technically challenging in some cases, and I would make the plea to the audience to make sure that a experienced, reputable lab is doing the testing. Thank you. We do have another question that is more related to part one of the talk. Um, that question is, is there a need to evaluate the health of the patient's immune system as well as the tumor's likelihood of response? We don't know a lot yet about how to evaluate uh, the host immune system. It's a fascinating question because uh, different people have a different amount of effective immune systems, and in fact, one of the theories is that why cancer is so much more prevalent in older patients is because our immune surveillance mechanisms start to fail as many organ systems decline in function, including the immune system, as we get older. So age may be a surrogate for immune, um, uh, immune response to begin with, just as one broad stroke. We don't have good tests yet to evaluate immune system. However, the one thing that we should evaluate patients for is for history of autoimmune um, uh, symptoms or syndromes. Those patients are at high risk of toxicity uh, if they're treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Now, the problem there is many patients have been labeled with an autoimmune disease without necessarily being thoroughly evaluated. So this is a murky area for many people. Uh, but if someone had, for example, um, active uh, lupus, they would not be a good candidate for immune therapy, uh, or at least the risk and the benefits would have to be very hev heavily uh, weighed because those patients are at very high risk for uh, additional immune, autoimmune um, toxicities. Thank you very much, Dr. Schwartzberg. That's an excellent talk and excellent questions and excellent answers. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks, everyone in the audience, for listening. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to thank you again, Dr. Schwartzberg and, and Dr. Ho, for a wonderful presentation. And thank you so much to the audience as well. Uh, again, the webinar and slides will both be available on our website shortly. And that's accc-iclio.org. Um, and also, you'll receive an email with the links that you can also share with your colleagues. And please don't forget to register for the next webinar, which is coming up on August 4th. And that's going to focus on communicating with payers for the practice administrator. So please tune into that. And last but not least, the agenda for the September 30th ICLEO conference is live. So feel free to peruse and to register today. So thanks so much and have a great rest of your week.